Welcome to Being the Genuine Athlete podcast, where we inspire those who aim for excellence in life and want to understand the how and what it takes to be a champion in life. My name is Jura Koschak. My purpose, dedication and commitment is to activate your potential, that you understand the ego through your sport and life situations. So I share and give you the tools to be just this, the genuine athlete. Are you ready to tune in? Hello, listeners of Being the Genuine Athlete podcast. Thank you very much. And here I have a very special guest today, uh, Jana Krivets. Hi, Jure. Thank you very much for responding on my invitation. I am excited and honored that I can uh, host a grand master in chess and uh, author of a book and a doctor in psychology. So I am amazed by your accomplishments. Well, thank you for your invitation. I was also very surprised when you contacted me. And it's always nice um, to hear fellow Slovenians around the world. And we can connect through these uh, social medias and similar topics and topics that we both like to speak about. Yes, great. Because um, uh, you already mentioned you're from Slovenia, like me. Uh, mm-hmm. And you're, uh, as I mentioned, grand uh, master in chess. You've reached that peak rating in 2008 or something, I think. Yeah, around uh, that year. Yeah, I have actually, um, during my whole life, I have these two careers. One is chess and one is psychology that I studied, a PhD. And uh, chess is also a big part of my life. I started to play chess when I was, um, I think, around nine. And uh, yeah. I'm, do, I'm still doing it, not so often, but it's very difficult for me to stop completely to play chess because it's part of me and uh, part of my identity. And I also like the game very much and um, I don't see the reason why I should stop completely. So, yeah, I've been in 11 Olympiads, 11 chess Olympiads, at 11 chess Olympiads. So it means uh, only the period that I uh, was going to Olympiad, it's 22 years, so yeah. Wow, <laughs> amazing, yes. Mm-hmm. Like you've said it in your book, if I can uh, read just the last sentence, chess has always been your passion and will probably remain explicitly or implicitly present throughout your life because you've achieved uh, national titles, you won some international titles, uh, so mm-hmm. it's a big part of your life and your thinking which we will go dive deeper in this uh, podcast interview maybe just if you touch uh, regarding psychology some people say you know like whoever studies psychology must have some issues in a way but I don't think that you had some issues you were more intrigued by something else yeah maybe <laughs> there is some a part of truth in that but, but we all have issues so uh, yeah, that's true i mean um yeah there's no perfect person but um i think it's important for all of us to think about ourselves and to get to know ourselves and uh, therefore we can um, do things that we are best at and we can maybe um, improve our weaknesses or find uh, ways to avoid our weaknesses so yeah and to develop our personality so um, i think there's nothing wrong <laughs> digging deep into ourselves yes and getting to know our real selves mm-hmm. who we are uh, i once i was in i went to american university of lebanon two years or few years ago for I think um, I came up with a question which I realized that it was a normal questionnaire and the question was who am I and uh, there were 10 lines uh, and people had to write the answers as much as they wanted and it turned out to be a very difficult question who am I but it's actually a simple question and people should ask this question all the time right who are you? You need to know who you are, what identify you, what defines you. Uh, but yeah, we never ask these questions in normal life. Um, so yeah, psychology, study of psychology is an um, opportunity to ask yourself questions like that. <laughs> and also in chess, I must say that um, it's another kind of analyzing yourself through um, the game of chess through the openings through your opponent um, so it's um, also a field where where you 
realize a lot of things about you and how you function in different situations and you need to be aware of that if you want to improve so um, yeah and it's interesting but um, these kind of things are often neglected or forgotten in life and people just live life and don't are not self-aware and uh, don't ask themselves about normal things uh, i don't know uh, I, I once um, spoke with someone and this guy asked me if i'm happy how can i answer that but it's a simple question are you happy are you satisfied with your life and if you're not you can do something else or you can correct something but still not many people ask such, such questions mm -hmm. like i just researched a bit uh, because i'm creating some content for athletes and i've written into google know know yourself and the mm -hmm. first few hits are uh, the results uh, regarding socrates in the ancient greek times how he emphasized to know thyself because if you do not know that and as you've written in the book um, from it's from gary kasparov the greatest as well chess player he writes in his book how life imitates chess uh, that self-awareness is essential in order to combine your knowledge experience and talent and thus enable you to reach your peak performance he says that very few people ever take the opportunity to this kind to do this kind of analysis uh, and as you've touched already we just drift we just live through life worried uh, and actually sad sometimes and devastated without actually touching it's like driving a car but never checking the engine just yeah. thinking that it will just go it should go it's a car no but you sometimes need to open the hood and check the stuff i'm i'm a man but i don't know anything about the car but i needed to because life situations brought me that i was alone on the street on the road and i needed to check under the hood so mm -hmm. that's what we have in common we look really a lot under the hood of mm -hmm. our mentality mm -hmm. character basics and psychology for me is most uh, important how to apply then this because knowledge it can be just philosophy and it can you know be in air it needs to be applied how did you come across in your life that you learned something in chess and you were already more of a digger like going deep in your mind and then you also studied this and then how did you apply all these different things from practice uh, chess mm -hmm. life and life and knowledge and education studies how did it all come together yeah first of all really good comparison uh with the car <laughs> and uh, a human being if you don't know what you maneuver you cannot maneuver it correctly so yeah really um good um comparison but yeah uh, as for myself i i was never um, big philosopher i don't like just to speak and speak and speak and just um digging and digging deep like psychoanalysis i don't like it that much because i i just don't see the point um for me the point is that um, you see the differences in functioning in your life in satisfaction it has to be you know some uh, feedback some positive feedback and this is also something that gives you motivation that gives you a kind of reward uh, and you cannot just do the process inf infinitely some people also do that just learning and learning and digging and adding the information yeah uh, but you need to know why you do that and um yeah you need to um i think it's this word the situations yeah. What okay? What do I need? What do I lack in this situation? What would I need to improve? And then do some process, and then you have to uh, be courageous enough to try if there are results of your work. Uh, and this is also a part where uh, a lot of people um, j just stop before they uh, even try. try the results in, in reality because it's. Uh, a lot of time it's easier just to study just to study and study but you have to study with a purpose with a reason with a goal so um, the goal should have uh, results should be measured somehow and you need to have that uh, i think it's the word your... retrospective that you are retrospective you add you you adapt you apply and then you retrospect <laughs> what's going on and you get that loop of the of the mirror Mm -hmm. but also check the results measure the re results yeah. why not you should not be afraid of 
yeah, measure your improvement, measure your training, measure what you are doing, whatever you are doing. The process should have a goal and goal should be measured and it can be measured. It, it, it doesn't have to be measured in numbers all the time, but it can also be measured in better feeling, better satisfaction. But it has to be uh, questioned. Yeah, and I think sports, you cannot avoid this um, mm -hmm. phase in sport. That's why I really think um, activities like sport forces you somehow mm -hmm. to do all this process, but to have a kind of structure and to um, test your training at some point. You cannot avoid that. You cannot resist that. Uh, you should not be afraid of testing things that you do because um, I think a lot of people try to avoid this uh, final phase and uh, it's rolling the <laughs> yeah. process and just doing that with no purpose. Yeah, athletes have a different, I've had a lot of clients in the last 10 years, mainly mm -hmm. majority of them were non-athletes at all, maybe as well, not even being athletes when they were young. Uh, and it's a big difference with athletes, how they process, how they accept and process and apply immediately. And it's a different kind of this uh, comparison and, and competing, competition, testing, probing, experiencing, mm -hmm. researching immediately. Because every week you have a game, every week you have a match. You cannot run away from it. That's, uh, yeah, that's true. And it's very important because you start to look at the, let's say, failure. It's not the end of the world if you... I don't know, lose a game. Consequently, you're not afraid to try again and again. Majority of people, if they fail, then their mm -hmm. self-esteem goes low and it's yeah. uh, really um, catastrophic and a disaster mm -hmm. in their life and they're not worth uh, as a person yeah. more. And this is really unhealthy. This drama, yeah. Yeah, because you you will get more and more passive and you will not be active. You will not try things. You're not, everything will be a threat for you. Whoa, what if I fail? Mm -hmm. But the failure in sport, you cannot avoid. And it's a part of the process that you become good. <laughs> and you, this is really a big thing for me, I think. And it's also very important in life not to be afraid to try. Uh, Challenge. This, yeah, to see things as challenge, not as a threat. This mm -hmm. is a, also in psychology something that should be taught, and this is very important. Uh, otherwise, you know, you have your own life perspective, and there is, let's say, uh, objective life. And if you would start to avoid objective life, objective. Um, uh, problem situations, then your own life will not be realistic. It will be, you know, um, disturbed and it will crash when you will face a real life and you will get more and more bad feelings from real life feedback if you will start to act passively, afraid, being afraid and stuff like that. And, um, you know, you need to harmonize your life perspective and objective real life let's say you have to get tuned <laughs> with uh, your life and you can do that only if you try if you test if you go life. out and play you need to play the game and live the life yeah, yeah. yes this not right here Ooh, not here right this. This, yeah. yeah. Okay, what have I done wrong? What have I done right? Uh huh. Now I have to. I will try this. Will this work? Uh huh. Yeah. This will work. This will bring me satisfaction. This will bring me good results. Whatever. But if you will try uh, one option and you will fail and you will be afraid to try another one and you will uh, get a bad feeling and you will feel uh, down and uh, mm -hmm. will lower your self-esteem and you will start to avoid situations that can uh, bring you negative results then you know we will never <laughs> find the right solution yeah. the right behavior the right uh, technique to uh, that would bring you to uh, some results so and in sport it's inevitable to mm -hmm. learn these things because otherwise you would go to one tournament and then you would never <laughs> go back again <laughs> because probably you will not win 
um, the first tournament you will go to and yeah the defeat will hurt you too much i don't say that the defeat doesn't hurt of course it hurts for me it still hurts but and i will not leave out of chess and it's it, it doesn't mean that much to me but it still hurts not that much that i wouldn't play chess anymore so i i try to learn something from the defeat and uh, of course you can learn much more from the defeat than from winning a game and you have to know that it's not permanent the defeat is not permanent you will learn and you will win next game so you need to be optimistic at the same time in this kind of thinking and perspective you should never lose hope that you will win next game and or next game or ne I, I once i lost five games games in a row and this is really you know you go to play a game you lose go to play another game you lose again next day another Another game, you sit, sit there for five hours, you prepare for two hours, and you still, again, you lose. And five days in a row, but sixth day, I won. And it's also something that um, you remember, you know, for life in the future. Even if you uh, succeed in a um, few trials, then it's still not over. You have another trial, another trial, another, that you can win or draw a game. So. This is, this is really an important thing in your life. And you know, these things are very useful um, to transfer from one activity to another, um, but you need to realize, yeah, and transfer, yeah, not just suck it in sport, but yeah. And also I think some people should, um, are more aware that, for example, sportsmen have this kind of generic uh, skills, uh, but some, for example, employees, uh, employers, uh, they just uh, take, take into consideration the grades in school or something like that. But I think these generic skills and um, something that a person learns through life experiences are much more important than being perfectionist is also not really um, good <laughs> for work or for life. Yeah. Uh, we are really digging deep, uh, so this is our common thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Immediately we dive deep. Uh, yeah, but it's deep with, you know... It is the with, basis. This is yeah, the basis. but with purpose, with not... Um, it's also, in chess, it's also very important, uh, and in life, I think, to know what is the real meaning of things, what is the priority, what is more important than, than other things. So this is also something to weight things in life. Uh, not, every, not everything is uh, on the same level of importance. Mm -hmm. And people also put everything in the same basket and, you know, and then they get upset if, I don't know, they break a glass, but you know, the, on the same level as in some um, relationship issues, for example, or maybe it's connected or it's behind, but you need to know what's important in life and what is not so important. Um, yeah, and you need to um, process things with, with a meaning, why you want to be aware of something, why you want to know some things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's touch a bit chess, mm -hmm. uh, if we may, uh, regarding um, how is chess a sport? Uh, because I see it as well. I'm not a chess player. I know how to move the figures, but uh, I haven't competed in chess or anything. Just let me know a bit about your experience. Chess as a sport, what does it mean to sit for so many hours, to be you know, very focused? Uh, and later on, we will go into the decision-making and the choices, mm -hmm. how the consequences come out of that. Uh, and maybe also touch in this answer as well, the man versus woman female male comparison and how chess is dealing with this gender mm -hmm. equality or, or competing mm -hmm. yeah chess is a sport i mean i'm confident that chess is a sport uh, i don't know actually how sport is defined but uh, how many physical activities should be involved but you know brain is also a, a big muscle and it uh, consumes 25% of uh, the whole blood of the body. So um, it's a big muscle and in chess it is uh, really very active. <laughs> and um, yeah, to sit five, six, seven hours even, it's really very, very exhausting. And the chess player can lose up to three, four kilos uh, per tournament. 
Um, so yeah, it, it's also physically demanded. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's also chess also demands physical condition because if you want to be really focused, for example, I um, I'm so focused during a chess game. I cannot hear. I cannot see anything. Uh, it's really that flow uh, that you're in and really concentrated. And for example, if you do test of concentration that lasts less than five minutes, um, people are really tired after that test, really exhausted. And what about being concentrated? Okay, not all, completely all the time like that, but um, yeah, most of the most of the time during the game you are concentrated, you're under stress, and before the game you prepare also. And okay, it also has this characteristics, uh, sports characteristics, competition, you know, in um, training, <laughs> you need to have this systematic um, approach. Program. Yeah, approach. And one of that is also physical, uh, to be physically fit, uh, because otherwise, you know, uh, um, at the end of the game, you start to, the concentration start to drop and um, you can overlook uh, some moves or even pieces easily. And at the end of the tournament, for example, um, on Olympiads, we have five players for four boards because it's too exhausted for one player to play the whole tournament. And that's why we try to switch for a particular game. And um, yeah, at the end of the tournament, one of the main questions is also who is still um, fit enough to hold the whole game. Um, so yeah, I think it is a sport. Let's mention now you achieved ninth place with your team in the Olympic. Mm -hmm. In Torino, it was in 2009, I think. We were ninth. It was it's the best uh, result in Slovenia uh, with Slovenian team. It, it will be difficult to <laughs> repeat it. Mm, we had one player from Ukraine at that time also in our team, uh, but yeah, she, she's very good and uh, that was really good result in on Chess Olympia team. We beat Philippines last round, I remember still. <laughs> Great. The ratings and the male, female, gender things in chess, can you explain mm -hmm. a bit about that? Mm -hmm. Maybe just uh, one comment. In chess, it's really, it's spread all over the world. It's more than 150 50 or 170 countries that are uh, competing on each Olympiad. So practically uh, the whole world because mm -hmm. uh, it's very approachable. Everyone can play chess. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it does not uh, demand a lot of, um, at least to get to some level, a lot of um, money. So the competition is really <laughs> uh, broad and tough. So um, yeah, ninth place was a good result if we take into account how many people on the world play chess and it, it's a bit bold, uh, bold but maybe after football <laughs> or even it can be compared you know to football because football is more western <laughs> sport but chess is played everywhere in china india they are really good now in, in chess you know, last olympiad um, chinese were first men and women section so mm -hmm. it's not only russia maybe as it's a common opinion it's really everywhere. Yeah, men and women. Men are in general better in chess than women. Uh, so if you want to achieve the title of, for example, man grandmaster, you need to have a um, higher elo and um, higher, um, more points at the tournament than uh, for women grandmaster. Uh, but yeah, women can play on official men tournaments and not vice versa yeah if you ask me why i uh, have my theory and i think it's very complex uh, answer uh, one is i think uh, we can look at it from evolution evolutionary point of view uh, you know women had to take care of many things and so concentration is very spread and we can focus on many things but on lower level but men you know they they were hunters and they had to chase that uh, animal and they they developed really narrow focus i think 
if you want to be top in a particular activity, this narrow focus and deep focus is um, more appropriate to achieve really top level in one particular activity. But women are yeah, capable of doing many things at the same time, which is, I think, underrated in uh, our world. <laughs> yeah, then it's this um, aggression, testosterone aspect, which is also good in things that you co that competition is involved. This is also something that favors men. And then is this social aspect because women, they become mothers and uh, they have other <laughs> priorities in their lives and they don't dedicate so much time to training even before men, they are more somehow motivated and they can train much more than, <laughs> than women, I think. We are different, so for top level and also in chess, this analytical thinking, which is quite important, is more um, adjusted to main, main kind of thinking, yeah. Um, women think more holistic and with more this verbal intelligence is more developed with women and this is something, yeah, that can result in men being better than women in in chess so it's i think complex but there are cases of course where women also achieved um, very high results i don't know judith polker was among 10 best men at a particular moment so it's not that women cannot achieve a very high result and there are a lot of women uh, who achieved uh, um, title of uh, men grandmaster so it's not impossible but it's more difficult i think so great 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 answer uh, just a quick uh, question if you can add here mm -hmm. how is the style of play when a lady meets men uh, regarding this as you mentioned holistic intuitive approach and mm -hmm. men more analytical uh, there are certain i think certain uh, openings and like by the book that you play chess but can you see the differences in the style of play? Yeah, people joke in chess that oh, you play like a woman, uh, so that you don't have uh, you know the red line through the whole game. So you play a bit here, a bit there, a bit <laughs> so more uh, spread all over the chessboard. And I don't know if you can really uh, divide the the type of play on woman <laughs> men's type, but. Um, it's just a good or bad chess. If a man lose to a woman, this can be a big, how to say, punch to his ego. <laughs> uh, so a lot of men take the defeat from women uh, very difficult. <laughs> and yeah, um, they search for many excuses. <laughs> and they say, she distracted me with a dress or something. But yeah, uh, I can assure you that they are not a gentleman during the game and they don't leave something. <laughs> They're really uh, fighting no matter if there is a man or a woman uh, across the board. So normal thing and of course it's right. But men have difficulties to uh, be defeated by a woman. <laughs> Great. That's, that's another topic uh, that's for another two hours that we can talk about yeah. uh, gender equalities, inequalities, differences. That's normal in, in mm -hmm. life to not mention any sport. Okay. Can we now touch a bit your doctoral thesis and connecting the dots before we move into the book uh, that you've mm -hmm. written and then talk about it uh, a bit. Um, so regarding your doctoral thesis and how chess is actually representing life choices, how you can co copy certain move, uh, moves from chess and understanding and cognitive abilities and mm -hmm. how is not managing your emotions really affecting your results in life not just in chess but you can see these choice because we make choices daily we make choices like i don't i think it's around thousand choices per day or something regarding when you drink what how you brush your teeth when you brush your teeth when you go out what you do it's a lot of choices that are of course automatic but uh, mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of choices that we can change but it's difficult so how is this with connection with your thesis if you can combine yeah well my thesis was not really about choices and emotions this is maybe another yeah topic and but my, my this, this was more some years ago so it's easy to forget the details but um, the main point 
I combined uh, again chess and psychology and I used chess as a research domain because it's it is often uh, used in cognitive psychology uh, chess as a research domain because it has its rules it's um, still very complex but at the same time it's limited and it has this elevating to find the strength of the player the expertise the level of expertise so it's really a good domain for researchers studies in cognitive psychology so i was um, studying how people process information um, of procedural type i was showing chess players and non-chess players and weaker chess players and stronger chess players at chess variants and they had to repeat it and some variants were not were not by chess rules and so uh, i tried to understand how we process this information and how we combine particular informations into chunks a group of um, group of informations that are more connected with each other than with other informations and it enable so yeah i tried to um to discover uh, the the mechanisms behind our processing so how big these chunks are how many uh, of them are recalled simultaneously to our short-term memory and how they depend on the contextual information so mm, we adjusted some chess programs so that we extracted these attributes that could relate to different context, contextual information. And then we um, try to establish how this influence to information processing, so success, time, and the size and number of chunks. So, yeah. What was the result? Or if you can describe it in a short version? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not so easy to describe it in uh, one or two sentences. Um, no, no, not maybe 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Take your time, no problem. Uh, for example, one conclusion was that um, experts do not uh, have, have different um, knowledge by the context, but just combine different pieces together. So they have bigger pieces and then they can recall more pieces at a time than novices. So maybe I will not go to the particular numbers <laughs> because uh, yeah. and it, it also these numbers depend on the order of the recall if you have to recall the information in the exact order the amount of chunks or the information then they drop if you if the order is not important then uh, you, re you can recall bigger number of the chunks and these numbers were different but the the cognitive abilities were not different between chess players and non-chess players so it's not cognitive ability that affects the recall the process of information recall but the knowledge and this knowledge that you um, have in your long-term memory and you connect in this discrimination net of chunks uh, enables you to recall information or chunks of information easier for example if i would uh, just randomly tell you some letters for example it would be more than seven plus minus two is a magic number like uh, how many information you can recall at the same time and if i would uh, list nine or more uh, letters you would have problems to recall exact letters but if i would for example tell you three words three long words you could recall more letters because you chunked the letters into words that are familiar to you and these words uh, this this word one word serves as one information unit to you uh, so we do the same in chess or wherever and uh, we are like zipping information into chunks and then we can recall it uh, easier and yeah seven if the sort order is not important and four if the sort order is important we can uh, recall for example but large and this uh, enlarging chunks you know up to i don't know how many units but it can be a lot of information in one chunk uh, let me rephrase the question earlier that I tried mm -hmm. to connect you to the to your thesis. So I, as a tennis player, table tennis player, 
and now mm-hmm. more tennis recreationally, but uh, earlier in a professional table tennis career, if I trained my techniques, tactics, uh, physical condition, as well emotional, uh, coping with emotions and pressure and everything, uh, in certain games that were, of course, more competitive or more, you know, uh, responsible results required or something and behavior, if I didn't have my emotions uh, under managed, uh, so if my emotions were running the game, it didn't matter how much chunks I had already figured out, how much I had uh, automated i could have recalled all the chunks but i couldn't perform uh, and i think that in um, may, I, i'm not sure now you can confirm or uh, not confirm this in in chess you sit so you don't need so much uh, movement but anyway you still need to move your figures and, and understand all the consequences uh, and you have the whole board in front of you uh, i'm not trying to draw a comparison now between sports and chess but how can in chess, uh, if you saw this, uh, maybe with yourself, uh, your style of play or other players, how did they cope with emotions and how did emotions sometimes drive the game? Mm-hmm. Uh, does it happen a lot? Of course, on a lower level, yes. On a higher level, how is it on a higher level that uh, these emotions are managed? Yeah, I mean, a lot uh, is going on <laughs> in a person during a chess game. A lot of emotions, definitely. Uh, uh, fear, uh, stress, uh, joy that can, uh, for example, um, it, it can also be bad if you make a move uh, out of joy and excitement because, you know, in this first excitement you can see something and just make a move and you didn't calculate enough or check uh, the other possibilities and after you might realize that uh, there is a move that you didn't see and uh, your opponent can win, for example, uh, because you you were you know, playing out of the, this excitement. As you said, um, knowledge is important, but um, it's definitely not uh, everything. It's also difficult to say what is the best move in particular situation because there is okay maybe i'm not even sure about that but maybe there is objectively best move but there can also be practically uh, best move you know a move that that does not suit to the style of play of your opponent and is practically better actually but maybe objectively it's not really the best but in the particular game. For example, Tal was a world champion um, and he was a very um, aggressive player. He played um, uh, moves that were very risky, uh, but ob- obviously he had a good um, and stable uh, inner psychological state uh, because to play risky, of course, being in a risky situation that you're not aware who's better, who's worse, and sacrificing pieces is stressful for everyone. And it's easier to play some uh, peaceful, <laughs> yeah, peaceful moves. He played risky moves with, he, he calculate, inculculated in his decision making the um, psychological aspect of the move or his opponent that it will be unpleasant um, for his opponent and if someone attacks you it's even more unpleasant if you have to defend than if you attack someone so um, and if you need to calculate a lot of options in that situation and you are afraid and you are feeling under attack it's a very big possibility that you will um, miss something, that you will miscalculate something. Um, yeah, a lot of people, for example, uh, have problems with uh, defense because you just start to see some uh, white mice, some ghosts, uh, <laughs> something that might even not exist, but you are, you know, in this situation that you're afraid of everything and. This, of course, is then bad for your uh, decision making, and and yes, in chess, it's 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 stressful because in each move you need to make a decision, and you never know actually which move is the best. Yeah, learn how to cope with 
uh, that emotions and you need to learn how to cope with the stressful situations because and yeah as i said you cannot just leave the decision to the situation you need to make it your own decision um you you need, you need to make it yourself so you need to play a move you cannot say okay i will not play a move now just you play <laughs> okay this would be bad for you but still sometimes you don't know what to do and you would rather say can you just you play i will just uh, leave this move out but you cannot do that you need to make a move all the time again and again more than 40 moves per game it's also very interesting because sometimes um, you cope with for example your way of thinking and time pressure. Um, I have a lot of problems with um, managing time because I like to think. I would think and think and over again. And uh, yeah, I have kind of problems with decision making, but then I become angry on myself. Why I don't, you know, uh, think systematically, go through one line and then another and then make a decision. Then, you know, this is not good uh, uh, if you just jump from one line to another and time, time just goes by, you have limited time. And um, uh, so you also have these inner conversations all the time. Uh, you have to train this and uh, go over. And uh, you also, for example, have situations when you see, when you can take, for example, a, a pawn, but somehow you have feeling that it's not really um, good to take it and then you don't know uh, whether you should trust your intuition or you should trust your calculation most of the time it shows that intuition is uh, more correct than calculation and uh, if you know that something stinks uh, you should not go there even if you calculate that okay some seems like nothing is wrong but intuition is more powerful because it's built on a large database of previous experiences um, you're you cannot consciously define why it's not good but if your gut tells you that it's not good it's uh, almost always right so um, yeah so a lot of processes um, during the chess game if you have if you're in time trouble again it's a special situation for example some people you have also a different tactics you know for example you are worse much worse and if you wouldn't and your opponent have has a lot of time spare so low chances to save the game and then some people go in time travel on purpose so that you know they start to play quickly and when the opponent sees this he starts to repeat if you play blitz on uh, uh, low time then it's a bigger chance for each of you to overlook something so your chances to save the game increase <laughs> so you have these uh, different strategic plans that are not always based on uh, some knowledge for example or uh, clear chess moves but in, they include many other aspects that could also relate to psychological aspects um, and also you, you um, try to go into positions that um, are not suitable for your opponent you before the game you check your opponent what he she he plays you see what style of play she has for example more dynamic more positional attacking and you try to enter the positions that suits you more than your opponent so yeah you can also for example feel um power of a person the willingness to win and it's very difficult to play with a person that is convinced that will win you even though you he doesn't tell you that you cannot see it in some um, physical <laughs> um, way but you can feel you know the power of playing the motivation to win yeah it shows in a play it's easier to play with uh, an opponent in chess we have draw some people are really satisfied with draw and you can feel it and it's much easier to play like that if you know that okay 
anytime I can maybe offer draw and <laughs> he will accept. And for example, this world champion, um, Magnus Carlsen, he's a current world champion. He's incredible. He, he squeezes every position, you know, against top grandmasters. In an end game, we have this opening, middle game and end game with few pieces on board and he will try and try and try and uh, circle them around with king and go there and go there and he has a wish to win out of nowhere. <laughs> Most of the time he succeeds, uh, he, um, yeah, he wins. And this is psychological power that affects the play and the players and the, you know to play against a person who is really eager to win it's difficult there must be a lot of other things <laughs> so you you mentioned a lot and someone someone who might uh, just listen now or in the in the middle of this conversation they might don't know that we are talking about chess that you come out of chess because yeah. you touch so many things mm. that are basics for other sports and as well life like yeah. uh, focus and this unconventional how we how our mind our ego in a way wants everything neat and conventional and we mm. don't want to adapt because we are lost we feel lost and that's those feelings uh, mm. maybe we can touch now uh, your book that's uh, improve your life by playing a game learn how to turn your life activities into lifelong skills uh, maybe you can mention in this way uh, what is the content of the book i know that it's goal setting as well maybe you mentioned something as well with intuition some routines uh, i know you've touched you've covered a lot already in this conversation uh, but maybe i'm i'm happy and honored that i'm talking to an author of a book uh, so that's like uh, really amazing <laughs> once again it's not out, so it will, yeah, be... it will be published uh, soon so mm -hmm. but it's written it's there uh, you feel yeah. it yeah i like to combine uh, knowledge, things that I've learned. And here is a book about um, yeah, the combination of chess and psychology with, let's say, my awareness of things that are in each of this domain. And um, I mean, speaking about um, these things in the, during this conversation, uh, but in the book I went through the phases of chess playing, but I don't think the book is um, only about chess and psychology, but I wanted to present on the case of chess how we can turn each activity into some uh, lifelong skill. <laughs> yeah, um, If we know what we are doing and why we are doing. So I went uh, through the, these different phases of chess career, let's say, not just chess playing, during training, how mm, we should set goals in whatever we are doing, how we motivate ourselves. If I would show you some um, uh, chess book, you would say, okay, who would learn this? Never, you can never learn this, but with the right approach, with the right motivation, and yeah, everything is uh, not just possible, but it can become interesting and you have to do things with, uh, with some passion, with some uh, motivation to learn something. Uh, otherwise, it's useless. We all do things in life just for doing it, but it's not the right way. Then I spoke also about this self-examination, how uh, it's necessary if we want to improve to know our weaknesses, our weak points, our good points. Um, then, yeah, about persistence, hard work, and uh, also very important the, the delayed reward because sometimes you want just instant gratification, but most of the time in life we need to invest some effort before we get the, the reward, and um, this is also important everywhere in life. I think uh, important thing to develop a way how to extract wisdom from previous masters, people who um, are good at something, not just repeat uh, their way, but to understand what they are doing. So this is another, uh, another thing that can be trained or taught. Um, then memorization techniques, how to yeah, 
memorize things, um, important how to work with modern te technology. And here I could also speak for hours with AI, how to um, approach to problems, having in mind the, the computer programs, AI programs that could be used to help um, to extract some um, patterns, some knowledge. Then um, this approach, how we should never st stop exploring and you should keep this child in your uh, curiosity and uh, and i was trying to involve a lot of um, proverbs and citations from the to me uh, wise guys <laughs> uh, from different fields or from history or uh, modern um, proverbs or cita citations of um, people who achieved something on their fields and i think these kind of people could give us a lot if we listen on the proper way, not just be jealous on people who achieved something. So yeah, the book is filled with these uh, citations. I like to uh, listen to people. I, in my life, I've learned a lot from conversation with people that I cherish and with from um, listening interviews or um, autobiographies of um, people who achieve something. I don't like to just read some theories, just my way of maybe of, the, of learning things. And then, yeah, then uh, I went to the phase of uh, playing a tournament. When you go to a chess tournament, what skills you need there and what is necessary to learn. So we have this book of preparation, how to prepare, how to um, adjust your pre uh, playing style to your opponent so it, nothing is fixed. And then during just the chess game, one of the first things that we've learned that you always need to have a plan. You know? Everything is better. Even a bad plan is better than no plan. <laughs> it was one of the first things that I've learned and it's also, I think, useful for life. Then okay, how to concentrate and focus. This is also important. And I also have some exercises then about this systematic thinking problem solving decision making is a big chapter yeah setting priorities parsing thought then synthesizing thoughts um, evaluating different options um, such things important thing that if you make a mistake that you admit that you make a mistake and you correct it uh, because in chess it, of, it often happens that you make a bad move and then you know that it's bad, you realize that it was bad, but it's so difficult to take it back or uh, and, and admit the mistake and play something else. You think you would lose too much time. That's why you just force that bad decision and you do even worse. Then, um, yeah, in chess, activation, it's really important. Being active, time is important, but also in life, time is important um, and it just passes by. And you need to realize this importance of time, of each moment um, that has this power, I don't know, energy that you can use or not. <laughs> In each moment, you can use this moment or you cannot use it. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not... Uh, in my life, I'm not the, the kind of person that has to do something all the time. Not like that, but, you know, if you have fun, if you, have, if you rest, it's also moment well used but you know it's used it's not just to be bored because you don't know what to do and you know being passive in chess it's very important who will give mate first so if you give mate one move after your opponent you lose you lose a game so you know it's a time race in a way another thing you need to take the responsibility no one is there uh, making moves for you. So you have to take responsibility for the result. But at the same time, you should not stuck at, uh, for example, at the loss. You need to forget some things and uh, forget. You should not blame yourself for, if, for losing a game too long because it will affect the next game. So you need to forget yourself um, and go ahead. Yeah, courage, optimistic thinking is another chapter. Um, 
if you resign, then it's over. But before you resign, you can be worse, but still you need to have this hope and the will to come back to the game. No? And many times during the game and also, I guess, in other sports, in tennis, you are, you know, in a bad position, but you can still come uh, rise from the, you know, come back and still win a game. So you learn that it's too late, only when you uh, resign. After that, you cannot do anything. But before, there's still some uh, chance to fight. And this gives you this optimistic thinking. Um, yeah, then about feelings, of course, we spoke about that. Ethics, it's also in, in sport everywhere. You learn um, how to act with high ethical manners. Uh, even if it's not uh, written in with rules, you just know that you will never do some things. And uh, I know, I, for example, in chess, if someone touched the piece and then played with another piece, even if just one random person saw this, the other chess players will not approve this and this person will, yeah not uh, have a good reputation among chess players so and it's just something that it's natural um then after the game yeah how to cope with stress how to um, see the failures uh, not as failures but as something that you can learn from um, so there are a lot of techniques how to um, that can be used to reduce stress relaxation techniques and so and so on and then after the tournament it's a, a different phase during the tournament after the game you just need to relax and put yourself together to go to next game but after the tournament it's time to you know make a analysis and learn something from the whole tournament even if you played good you can learn something from it that we should not forget that yeah always you need to have this um, preparedness or will to change to grow uh, and you need to be able to hear some critics to hear some maybe at that time not nice things <laughs> from people uh, that you don't want to hear but you need to incorporate it in a proper manner to develop your game mind and body how they work together because also you know the stress itself leaves a lot of um, physiological effects there are hormones and things that are in your body and you need to be aware of that and yeah that you find find in life things that you like to do in general ask yourself what you what is it that you like to do uh, or what kind of openings that you like to play this kind of more abstract questions uh, after the tournament, it's time for this more abstract analysis. So yeah, then I, I, I spoke a bit about um, the community of chess or whatever you do, you have your community, which is also um, this socializing thing is also an um, important aspect of being active or um, yeah, being incorporated into uh, some activity more deeply. It gives you also this aspect. Uh, then I spoke about negative aspects of chess a bit <laughs> because I don't think really that this should be emphasized because in general there are more positive <laughs> things. Uh, and then some theories, I incorporated some theories. There were a lot of researches that were done on chess on different topics from educational topics to rehabilitational for ADHD, autistic uh, people, how chess can be a good mean to um, use for different issues also with addictions. So this is uh, my book in short. <laughs> Amazing that uh, you've put the whole your life work and knowledge and experiences together mm -hmm. in this uh, book that will uh, be published and you've uh, touched so many aspects of what a genuine athlete already is the winning mm -hmm. mindset but not the crazy one like that uh, that you can have that balance and the moral codes the mm -hmm. how to approach uh, life actually because 
life is not just sport or just chess, it's everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I had one player yeah. once that said, I'm like that only on this court. I'm not like that of a person outside. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are, but you're not pressured enough to get that mm -hmm. out uh, outside of the court of the match. Mm -hmm. Maybe just for the end, please, uh, Jana, can you give listeners or the viewers a uh, few of the basic or what you will what you like to point out are maybe some steps or routines that now in these unconventional uncertain times that we live in that are like realistically uncertain because everything is uncertain we just illusionally uh, accept or uh, expect that it's that it is certain but nothing is certain but now it's more evident now it's more vivid maybe just something that you like to point out uh, to the listeners and viewers, the routines or the approaches on how to, you've mentioned a lot through this uh, call, but maybe something that you want to point out. I don't know if I would point out the routines, uh, but maybe the main um, questions that one should follow, I think um, it's also, when you said uh, about the Janine athlete, uh, I, I think, you should um, see it as a genuine um, human being. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, as you said, just being an athlete can also mean some problems with your identity. What if you, you got injured or what if you cannot uh, do this? I'm not saying that you have to do hundreds of things at the same time on, on top level, but you know, you, you still have to see yourself not just as athlete, but as a friend, as a, you know, yeah complex person and um, i think the most important is that you follow your yourself <laughs> what you want what makes you happy and this is very um courageous things a lot of time to do um and i think it also um gives you additional motivation and um, energy to you will do things differently if you approach it with a um, enthusiasm and uh, that you really um, ask yourself what makes you happy what you would like to do and just follow that lead um, I can understand that it cannot be just straightforward but um, you know if you are persistent then um, I think it must have uh, must bring you the results and satisfaction in life which is at the end, important and uh, the feedback, the kind of feedback uh, that shows you that you're doing things right. Yeah. Yeah. And those are the words of a grand master. So you mastered some <laughs> things and uh, you've uh, broadened your horizon, the look on the life. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very amazing uh, talk that we had. And thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I mean, for me, it's always nice to speak about chess and psychology. And I'm really grateful, grateful to you that I had this opportunity um, yeah, to speak about it and have this um, nice and deep conversation with you. Thank you. All the best for you, your book, your endeavors, and keep playing life. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Goodbye to Dominican Republic. Bye bye. Easier processing and hmm. we have a visitor. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. She wants to be on camera. Continue, yeah. please. <laughs>